On. Not that they don't put up a fight regardless. You would think that they don't get enough screen time playing Fortnite and whatever other nonsense. My son has been streaming Terraria, uh, which is its own amusing and hilarious set of, of things. Hey, I can, I, hear, you up. I can hear an echo of myself, but a few seconds later. Andrew is audible, yes, so that is good. All right. Am I audible, audience? Can you hear me? 
sing for us. I saw that, and no, I'm sing not going to us. sing. La, la, Nobody la, la, wants la, to hear la. me sing. Uh, no one wants to hear singing. All right. I did not change anything. I literally just turned things on and off, and it came back. So, so you, yeah. You you applied the standard Windows fix. I did. Um, I don't know what happened there. I don't know. You're back to being out of just my left ear, but I'll manage. Okay, but now there are some speakers running. So it's a bad echo. What? Bad echo. I can't. I can't with this right now. What is going on? Hang on. I got to monitor further away from the mic. This is going pretty poorly, I would say. The pre echo. You hear the echo first, and then your loud, clear voice. Yes, we still hear the static background. Yeah, there is a staticky background. I don't know what that's about. Is your fan running, Andrew? Your laptop fan? Yes. Is your mic near it? Mm, like four feet away. Weird. I do hear ourselves a few seconds delay very faintly in my headphones. How would you hear ourselves very faintly in your headphones? I mean, okay. That's probably my monitor. Sorry. Um, Andrew has a great mic. Echo. You sound like you're I, can, for... I can mute and see if that causes it to go away. Yeah, like mute it for a second. No, I definitely still hear, like, a fuzzy background noise. Muting it made it louder a tad. Oh, good. That, that's impressive that it makes it louder. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, uh, I really don't know what to make of this, folks. I really don't happen. I really don't know. So let me mute myself, and we'll see if that helps. Does this mean I have to act like I'm crazy and have a conversation all to myself? Nope. Background noise is still there. That, I don't know how to fix that. Possibly a laptop mic for sure. Let me just... Make sure that this is disabled over here. Did this the other day without issues. Well, without major issues. So let's see. I'll put volume on. I'll put volume on. Google Hangouts noise. Don't use Google Hangouts. Okay, it could have been my laptop laptop so that laptop mic was unmuted folks do you still see if disable a laptop mic from obs there is no way to do that you still hear any background noise yes it's still there wow this is really 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 crazy All right, so if we both mute. It's still there. All right, audience, uh, yeah, the, the, the background noise is still there. 
I'm not sure. Testing, testing, one, two, three. All right, got it. Perfect. All right, now we can get started, I think. All right. We, I believe we are all set. What was the issue? Uh, <laughs> so for whatever reason, there's multiple uh, monitors, audio monitors in OBS, because I think... Uh, Eric uses like his output from his uh, like sound card or audio from his like coming out of his headset and the setup 
So like there's four different toggles you have to do. Some of them are local, like desktop audio and mic. And then some of them are scene specific, like headset audio mic and headset monitor capture, which are things Eric's having to do on his rig that are mm. not what I'm used to. So yeah, part of it's familiarity, you know, this being what our third stream officially ever. And the other part of it is just good documentation. So we'll get this fixed, folks. Don't you worry. Uh, right now we have good sound and good picture from what I'm seeing on our on my monitor. Um, so Eric, or not Eric, Andrew, could you like reintroduce yourself for the audience yeah. as if we have just begun? Uh, <laughs> you mean we haven't been doing this? No. Uh, so. Yeah. No. Um, all- so to uh, to introduce myself, I am Andrew Sullivan. I'm a technical marketing manager with Red Hat's Cloud Platforms Business Units. Um, so uh, while I have not been doing the whole live streaming thing um, for very long, my son is much more experienced in this than I am. He, he streams Fortnite and Terraria and various other things off of um, in his copious amounts of spare time these days because, you know, homeschooling is just just wonderful. It's it's lots of fun. Uh, I can't um, imagine. I have a four year old, thankfully. So we just have to home preschool, which is a lot it, easier. I, I am uh, strictly tech support. I give my wife 1000% full credit. She's the one who handles all three kids actually doing the school wow. at, at home sure. schooling thing. So the, uh, the fun part is every once in a while, I'll get a message from her because pie hole is blocking something that the kids need, but uh, yes, that is, that, that is kind of, I'm beginning that journey of household child protection on the internet kind of deal. So yeah, the next rainy stretch we get, which is coming up, uh, Max is getting his first computer, which is a very, very old uh, MacBook Air. So yeah. he'll be playing on lego.com and maybe one day he can teach me how to actually live stream. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I only use it for uh, for ads and for the tracking protection because I'm one of those weirdos. Uh, yeah, I actually just flipped over to the the Cloudflare malware protection thing, and that seems to help. There's a bunch of other stuff that I have done in the past, like I've done Pie Hole, but it blocks weird things in the Facebook app and does weird stuff that my wife doesn't like. So I just well, was like, see, there's oh, your okay, problem. Never mind. You're, you're still using Facebook. Well, um, I don't use Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> other users that are of significant importance to me use Facebook in this household, so I have to support them. Yeah. I will say, um, if you want a low effort, use uh, nextdns.io. Um, I, so, I actually I set my mother up with them, and yeah. it has been zero efforts to get the ad blocking and stuff working for her. Nice. Yeah, so I'm using the, the Cloudflare similar malware protection DNS setting or DNS servers. And uh, it was super, super, super uh, easy to do that. And, you know, like a lot of the pop-ups and, you know, nonsense has just gone away. Yeah. All right. So I, anyways, enough of me rambling about some internal house IT stuff. Um, so back to the uh, introduction a little bit. So my background, um, a few years ago, I was a customer. Um, I, 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 as a customer, I ran... Um, either as an administrator, as an architect, uh, virtualization infrastructure, storage infrastructure, all kinds of other things. Um, so it, it gave me a good background coming into Red Hat's, um, where I came from a storage company, um, with the virtualization piece, um, as well as now with OpenShift virtualization being um, re-publicly announced, right, or re-re-announced as you know what was the the feature formerly known as container native virtualization. Mm. Um, so it gives me the ability and the chance to really explore a lot of different aspects of technology. So OpenShift and Kubernetes with containers, and then virtualization, kind of blending old and new, and all of that other stuff. Um, but I'm not here to talk about OpenShift virtualization. Um, we're actually going to do that on Thursday with Reese, Thursday yes. morning, Eastern time, Thursday yes. afternoon, UK time where Reese is. Yeah. No, I can't wait um, for that show either because just all the virtualization and stuff we have going on right now is really, really exciting to me. Yeah. It, it's, um, who would have thought that it would have been exciting to be a part of virtualization again, right? Right. Exactly. Right. Like containers were all the rage and now it's like, whoa, we still have all these VMs laying around. Now what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as I've been, you know, chit-chatting here a little bit, um, I, you can see I'm bringing up a couple of different things. So the first one that I'm going to bring up here is the documentation because um, I, I want to play along with and I want to not do this from memory. And I would rather look at the documentation so that we kind of can walk through that 
Um, I also understand that we added a new section to the documentation around uh, what we're looking at now, which is creating a custom virtual machine template. So I specifically want to walk through that so that we can customize the virtual machine that is going to be used for all of the CoreOS nodes, be they master or worker as a part of the deployment. Um, and then the other thing that I brought up here was cloud.redhat.com because I will need to go in and grab my pull secrets because I don't ever copy it anywhere. I just log in because that's easier. Um, and then the other thing that I've got is my Red Hat Virtualization Manager. Uh, so this is my home lab. Um, I, I've been using this on and off for various things for the last um, couple of years, actually, even before I worked for Red Hat. Um, wow. It's a relatively modest um, home lab. I, I think I have, it's two servers. I think both are running Ryzen 5 2600 CPUs. Um, they're, pretty yeah, good. It, it's, yeah. I mean, not bad, but pretty good, you know, I mean. Decent. You know, it, it does what I need it to do. Um, and then I have that separate from um, the stuff that runs like the pie hole and all of that. Uh, the only place that it touches is my home server, um, not the home lab, but the home server runs the storage, um, which I've been actually been having a lot of fun with that. I have a uh, an NVMe drive with a VDO, um, you know, compression, deduplication, et cetera, on top of that. And then that provides NFS storage out to the home lab. Um, so it's it's worked really well. Um, it allows me to set up, tear down, mess around with, kind of do everything that I need to do inside of, um, you know, the the things that we do, which it seems like I'm setting up and tearing down OpenShift clusters at least once a day nowadays. Yeah, at least, yeah. Um, and it gives me a chance to not have to rely on AWS or Azure or any of those other services, which are um, sometimes flaky, in addition to which, you know, just internet bandwidth these days is always... Uh, a challenge to come by, shall we say. So um, a quick tour, if you haven't seen the Rev interface before, this is the Rev uh, 4.3 interface. Um, I think I'm running 4.3.9, oops. Yeah, about, yeah, 4.3.9. Um, so pretty straightforward. Uh, if you weren't aware, if you didn't catch the various news, um, Rev 4.4 beta is available today. Um, I actually got the email saying that it was available like two hours yeah, ago. Yeah, like so. Yeah, I just got it too. Yeah. yeah. So if you're interested in the Rev 44 beta, definitely go and check that out. And there's there's lots of interesting stuff that are happening there. Um, but again, that's not the topic of today's uh, uh, subject. So I'll do a quick tour of my home lab here. Um, so virtual machines, I've got a few things inside of here. So you see, I actually have a, uh, a powered off cluster that I manually provisioned. This is what I do a lot of the open virtualization testing from. I'm doing nested virtualization with this. Uh, and then I use Christian's extremely awesome helper node. Um, although I don't use the uh, straight Ansible playbook version, I do some modifications to remove things and change things to suit my particular um, deployment. Um, like, like as a setup specific or just preference? Yeah. Cause, uh, so the way that I have my house set up, I actually have three separate networks. Um, so oh, I okay. have all the home stuff, which has, you know, the pie hole doing the ad blocking and stuff like that. And then I have a work network, which is where my work laptop sits along with the management interfaces for the home lab and all that other stuff, which has no blocking or anything like that. Cause I don't want to have to worry mm -hmm. about that getting in the way. Um, yeah, and I've then I have repos getting blocked before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's just one extra layer of things that, you know, uh, if the company wants me to have access to it, I'll have access to it and, and let the various, um, if you can, see, if you have good eyes, you can see that there's a, one of these things up here is a virus scanner and all that other fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, the third network is the lab network. So I have, as a part of that, um, the helper node runs bind that has DNS. Um, it also has DHCP, uh, configured dynamic DHCP updating inside of there. Um, so we can pull all of those addresses and it, it's just, it has a lot of churn. And the only thing that sits inside of there is, well, lab related things. Um, so it makes it pretty convenient without having to worry about, um, you know, the DNS. something. Yeah. 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 You know, I don't want to break my work stuff because then I'm unproductive. And um, turns out when they pay me, they want me to do productive work. It's um, amazing how that works. I know. <laughs> so uh, with that being said, um, so I have the helper nodes. Uh, I don't remember if that's running CentOS or RHEL, but um, either way, it uses Christian's playbook. Um, and it does a phenomenal job of providing all those services. Uh, and then simply the hosted engine. So this lab started out as a single node deployment. Um, 
it started out with, I had one server that I deployed self-hosted engine onto, and then I remounted NFS back off of the local drive to host virtual machines. Um, I actually have a gist out there somewhere that um, showcases that. Let me see if I can bring up something that's actually logged into something. Something that's logged into something. Yeah, well, I started a, uh, and this one is not it. I started a uh, incognito tab so that um, way yeah. I could, it, I didn't have to worry about any of the other things popping up. Although Firefox, I only use for lab related stuff anyway. So I don't know why I was so worried about it. Um, but it looks <laughs> like I'm not signed into to GitHub on Firefox anyways. Oh, fun. Oh, I closed out. Um, so usually I use Brave for my primary browser, but oh, okay. Brave being Chromium based loves the RAM and my laptop hurts enough. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, well, I, I, I just closed that. We'll let it be. Good call. Um, anyways, so self-hosted engine, it's running off of, uh, if we come over here to the storage domains, we can see I have a single storage domain hosted off of NFS. Um, funny enough, this it says 750 gigabytes. Uh, it's actually only a 250 or maybe 300 gigabyte drive, right? Video, deduplication, et cetera. Um, mm. Really helpful feature, especially for a lab. Yeah, no kidding. Um, networks wise, I've got a couple of networks to find in here. You can see this is my primary management and then the VLAN 101 is the lab network. So where I'm going with all this is this is the information that we'll need in order to do the uh, OpenShift install. So in the last thing that I'll need here is my handy dandy terminal window that I'm going to increase the font size of a little bit. Thank you. Is that is that better? Uh... I can keep going. Let's, let me look at the Zoom window to get a better view. Uh, go a little bit higher, a little bigger. That might, there, wow, that's okay. Yeah, that is very readable to me. All right, good. So this is all information that we'll ultimately need uh, once we get to the point of creating our install config and everything else inside of our environment. So last but not least, I need, um, oh, actually I did need that window. So I have our install tools. So if we look at, for example, OC version, you can see that I have 443. I just pulled these yesterday because I was mm -hmm. wanted to check and make sure that everything was had a reasonable chance of success today. Um, it did, by the way. Good. Um, so I just pulled the new GA versions yesterday. Uh, open shift. I, so... FYI for anybody watching, I'm not one of those people who can talk and type at the same time. Oh, that's totally fine. Uh, now yeah. that I know that, I can help you uh, as you're typing away and hacking on things. Yeah, some people can do that. They don't have an issue with... Um, they, there's one of the product managers that I work with, Steve, who... Uh, oh, yeah. I, Steve. I, yeah. I, mm -hmm. yeah, I have seen him hold a <laughs> microphone while talking, while typing one-handed all simultaneously, and it completely blew my mind. That is a skill that I, my brain doesn't work that way. Yeah, we had Eric on his uh, walking treadmill yesterday, and I was pretty mind blown. So, like, if if you can talk and type at the same time, like intelligently, without saying a bunch of ums and uhs, that's very impressive. Yeah, I, I, so the walking thing, I'm okay with. Um, I find that uh, it affects my typing accuracy. Yeah, like, like I have that. to be super careful, like slow down. Yeah. So all I'm doing so here is uh, here? I'm just cleaning up my my. Uh, usual working directory. Sweet. So with all of the information that we have, oh, I wanted to do one other thing, which was uh, remove the cache credentials file. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially what I'm trying to do is mimic if I were doing this for the very first time, having never done this before and encountering all of the various prompts, all of the different er errors, issues, everything else that you might see um, as you're going through this process. And with all of that done, we can come back over here to the documentation. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is pull down our release. And somewhere down here, Azure, nope, GCP images, there we go. Can you? Is our OpenStack image. I can't. Yeah, can you? Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, that might be just a smidge too big, but that's fine. Leave that as is. All right. So 
Remember Rev, much like OpenStack, or maybe OpenStack like Rev. I don't remember. I think Rev predates OpenStack. So OpenStack like Rev is KVM based. Uh, so we can use the same image for both of these things. So all I've done is follow this first step in the directions, which is go over and look at this JSON file to then use this URL based on that in order to pull our uh, uh, image. So okay. I will switch cool. back over here, paste that in. So yeah, the, the image pool is very important because we need everything that is contained within it. See how I did that? You were typing. I, I did. <laughs> now I actually <laughs> feel it was on. helpful. Uh, yeah. The zoom window thing gets in my way here. And then I also need the base URI. And that base URI is specific to the region that you are in, correct? Um, I don't know if it is or not. Uh, looking at the JSON file, it's in the root level. I thought that was interesting. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure to be honest. Ah, I don't need it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, grab the base URI, do not press enter. Um, find the open stack, copy the value of path. So all we're doing is coming here and pasting that guy in so that we build up the full URL for our image. Nice, very nice. And we'll see just how good my gigabit internet is. It's way better than my 120 me meg internet, I'll tell you that much. You are a very lucky person to have a uh, gig internet. That was the that was the one downside to leaving the the Raleigh area when we moved up here to uh, Michigan was that, yeah, there was definitely not going to be gig internet in our future. We're waiting on 5G here. Yeah, or uh, what's the what's the one that Elon Musk and company are doing? Starlink? Star, so Star that actually something? is, that might actually be an option for us because we're at a high enough latitude. So I actually, so I'm a nerd. I love space um, and satellites and like all that stuff really fascinates me. So I've been keeping up with that. But uh, yeah, he's actually opening up Starlink to the higher altitudes uh, or higher latitudes uh, because that's where he's got satellite positions right now, the company does. So we might be able to get that and it'd be faster than <laughs> our terrestrial <laughs> internet, but it would still be high latency, which would not work for live streaming. So yeah, I don't know how they're going to get around that, but we'll see. Yeah. I, I know enough to know that I don't know very much about it. Um, well, I used to have to like control and like point stuff at satellites for a living. So that's part of it. <laughs> <laughs> just aim upwards, right? It's Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what we do. We just aim upwards with enough power. You can connect to anything. <laughs> so uh, wh while we were chatting, um, all I did in the background was unzip um, or G unzip the mm. uh, the QCOW image. And I'm going to import that. So for anybody who hasn't uh, experienced uh, Rev in a good long while, there is no longer the need to have a dedicated ISO or image domain or any of those other things. It's all one big happy storage domain, which makes oh, things a lot easier. Oh, thank, thank you. <laughs> so the, excuse me. Um, yeah, the, the, the storage the different various storage things that you could put together with the the elder versions, older versions, uh, always confused me uh, as far as where do I pull which asset from? Because someone would always create something for some bespoke project, and then like it would just snowball as far yeah. as where things ended up. Yeah, well, and it just complicated administration in general. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you need a, a block storage domain for VM disks, but you need an NFS storage domain for ISO drives as well as templates. Uh, and uh, yeah, it it's just much easier doing it this way. Exactly. Um, so all I'm doing is importing that. Um, I do have the terrifyingly quick speed of one gigabit um, going between all of these machines. So it takes it a little bit. So, and all I did, I skipped over the part of using Ansible for this. Um, so, and I guess I did skip a step. Is it an important step? No, well, I, I G unzipped it, but I haven't gotten to the part in the docs where we need to import the disk yet. Ah, 
Got it. Uh, so the only thing that this part of the uh, documentation goes through is seeing what resources are available in your Rev cluster and the number of uh, virtual machines and stuff that we already kind of did at the beginning. Nice. Yeah. Um, so here. So this is the, the step where we're going to get to, which is attaching the disk that we just uploaded to a new virtual machine that we'll, we will turn into a template. So you see it's finalizing and complete. And now we can come back over here to our virtual machines and we'll create a new one. Sweet. So you already have names picked out and everything? No, I, I, I go by the incredibly creative and unconventional. I name them by use. Um, so what? Blasphemy. Yeah, my, I know my, my son's desktop is named Jackson Desktop. My daughter's desktop is Lily Desktop. And yeah. <laughs> so for my project stuff, I use the Looney Tunes naming convention. But for like the home stuff, yeah, it's definitely Julie's iPad, Max's, you know, MacBook Air, you know, uh, my my laptop and stuff I use for work. I still named weird things too for Looney Tunes. This one's actually called Michigan J Frog. So yeah. Yeah, I, I will sometimes um so for example, the last time I did a demo video, I think you used Star Trek characters. Mm. And um so I used the original Star Trek and the and next generation characters. Um I think I did one where I used sandwiches. Um I was showcasing labels and affinity, oh, nice. anti affinity and used yeah. um like bread types, cheese types, meat types, because let's face mm. it, I'm a I, yeah, I eat if food. you were a cheese snob, but you wouldn't want your, your, you know, your 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 pods running on American cheese, right? Like, yeah, you would want them on something fancier. So all I'm doing, and I know I haven't looked at the docs, but I, I'm relatively sure this is what's in the docs, is configuring the template virtual machine that we're going to use. So I attach the disk that we just uploaded. I set the network adapter to be my uh, mm -hmm. uh, lab freelance. We come back over here. So see new virtual machine, um, leave the template unchanged. That's referring to this guy up here. Okay. Um, oh, I didn't set the operating system. I should do that. Leave it optimized for desktop. So we will set this to CoreOS. Did I skip it? Is it abbreviated? There it is. There. Um, optimized for desktop. Um, so you can create different templates um, inside of Rev that have different sure. characteristics. Um, there's also this instance type, which is like a t-shirt sizing. Uh, so you can oh, use nice. t-shirt okay. sizing for things like, you know, a small VM represents, I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, we'll say one CPU and two gigs of RAM. Mm -hmm. So you can pretty easily create um, those. So the optimized for is an interesting one um, in That's that. It, <laughs> yeah. So it pre-tunes KVM, right? So when it launches the uh, QMU, uh, uh, instance, it pre-tunes based off of what's uh, what you select here. So if we select high performance, for example, right, it will do CPU pinning, it will do, um, it will create IO threads, it'll do a number of other things in order okay. to facilitate that profile. Um, huh. So interestingly with, uh, so prior to Rev 4.3, um, the high performance, so doing things like CPU pinning, would have stopped live migration from happening. With 4.3, live migration mm. can still happen and all of that. So in and the that, high performance mode. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. The I.O. threads in particular can make a difference if you have a lot of I.O. happening or if mm. you have um, or need ultra low latency I.O. Right. But you can also set that without having to set the the high performance. You can see here I.O. threads enabled. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, so most of these I'm going to leave at the defaults. I'm not going to walk through every setting inside of Red Hat Virtualization um, and talk no, about them. No, please don't. <laughs> you, you don't want to hear a dissertation on VertIO SCSI enabled? Yeah, no, uh, I, yeah. I'm good. Thanks. Um, so yeah, here I attach the drive that we just uploaded, um, make the disk bootable, um, kind of continuing down. Mm -hmm instantiate a, a network interface for each vnic profile okay we did that that was me associating the uh network interface so 16 gigabytes of ram with a guaranteed size of eight gigabytes four cpus um oh set virtual cores per socket or cores per virtual socket to four so we'll come back up here to that 
So we want one socket with four cores instead of four sockets with one core. And click OK. OK. So now we have our fancy dancy template machine. Nice. So one thing that we want to do, and this offers us, actually, let me make sure it's, we're, we're following on our, our steps here. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I do want to do, if you were paying attention, uh, let me cancel this, our disk size is only 16 gigabytes. Um, so we want to make sure that that is at least 32 gigabytes um, and preferably something like 120 gigabytes um, in size. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to edit this. I'm going to edit our disk and I'm going to extend the size and I'm going to bring it up to like 60 gigabytes. So it's what's 44, yep. extending it by 44. Golden rule number one, never do arithmetic in public. Yes. Uh, so if you wanted, you know, if you, you said 120 gigs preferably, but you expanded it to 60, any particular reason why you didn't just go the 120 route? Is that um, because totally I am off the top of my head. I am not sure if it does thinner, thick provisioning and okay. I don't, want to take the risk of of running out of capacity in my um in the middle of your demo yeah no, that would be bad or anything so um it, it is important to make sure that you allocate enough space because of course core os logs um you know container images you know all the graph storage is it still called graph storage that was a docker term um uh, anyways no what is it uh layer storage I, I guess. yeah mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know what I don't yeah, know what the current term is. Yeah, um, but we want to make sure that we have enough capacity that that's not going to cause an issue. Um, I think early on we encountered some issues in the uh, uh, in the tech preview for IPI where the drive would fill up and it would cause the cluster to go offline because not enough capacity, and that's bad, that's obviously. Fun. Yeah, no, that's. Mm. So our template is created, our disk size has been expanded, um, much like you would expect with anything else um, that is, uh, um, it's not running CloudInit, right? It's running Ignition, but it'll automatically expand to fill up all the available space. So, so from, the, from the chat, uh, who is this? I, don't, I can't, R-O-L. Rolf, yeah. Rolf. Rolf, he says 32 gig minimum, 120 yep. recommended for production environments. Yep. Yeah. So that's yeah, and I think that's in the documentation. It, it's definitely in the documentation for VMware and the other UPI bare metal mm -hmm. installation methods. Um, so I'm going to assume it's in the documentation. Yeah, there's usually a system or uh, sysrec page somewhere. So the last step in the documentation down there was to turn this virtual machine into a template. I'm going to creatively name this Arcos Template V1. Um, keeping all of our storage stuff the same, we're not changing the storage device it's on or anything like that. And we do not want this seal template to be checked. Why is that? I'd uh, because that will attempt to run, what is it? Uh, there's a command that it attempts to run that basically resets the system ID and all of that other stuff inside of there. Oh, so, it swizzles all the UIDs and everything yeah, else. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like sysprep is for Windows and all that other stuff. Got it. Um, and I believe that we want this in cluster two. Can I move you? Uh, yeah, we do want it in cluster two. You're gonna misbehave. Oh. oh, hit cancel and then just redo it. Just the escape key or something. There we go. Oh, there you go. That works. Uh, technology. Technology is hard. Always. If it was easy, we'd all be doing it. So I do have two clusters. Um, so if we were paying attention to our hosts over here, uh, so one of these, this is where I do the self-hosted engine. It's a, an old, old Lenovo. 530W or W530 Intel based laptop. Um, is it a big heavy one? I feel it like is. I've had that one. Yeah, yeah. I've had yeah. The, Yes, I had that at a previous job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it rivals um, the MacBook Pro, the 15 inch MacBook Pro in weight. 
Um, right. I think Which, the power brick makes it heavier, actually. Yeah, and you can get two of them. Uh, yeah. Eh, just for fun. <laughs> so this this one, it, it runs the helper node. It runs basically things that I keep running most of the time because I'll take the two primary hosts and turn them off on the weekend, stuff like that. You know, trying to be environmentally conscious or something. Yeah, I'm waiting for that to become a lot more automated. Right, like so, outside of the box, have something manage power everywhere else kind of deal for my home. That'd be great. Yeah, uh, and it's funny because if we were in a true data center scenario, you can do things like that, right? right. You know, Rev yeah. has the ability to schedule based off of, you know, using as few hosts as possible. With fencing, you can do things like power on, power off hosts automatically. There's a lot of stuff inside of there that can all work to help. Um, but I'm not at a data center. I'm, I'm in a house. I can turn my head like this and I can see one of the, one of my hosts over here. So, um, so the, the message came up saying that it was done with the conversion. I'm going to go over here to the templates and we can see we have this RH core OS template V1. Nice. Okay. It's on cluster so, two and everything. Everything's going according to plan. All right. So at this point, um, we created our custom virtual machine template. So we will just walk through the documentation around this. Um, blah, 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 telemetry. So requirements, we saw we have 439. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a data center whose state is up. That is yep. a good thing. Yeah. Um, we do have at least one rev cluster, also a good thing. Uh, minimum of 28 vCPUs. I don't have that many, but uh, we'll chance it. Yeah, I think you got this. Um, 112 gigs RAM. Uh, so one thing to note um, in my, where is it? Uh, in my cluster configs. So by default, Rev is ultra conservative, right? So it doesn't do things like turn on memory uh, uh, deduplication, et cetera. Right. So you, or over commitments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can go in here on your cluster and we can do things like, set my memory optimization so that right. it'll overcommit at 200%, um, count threads as cores. So balloon optimization, yep. uh, KSM, which is kernel sharing, kernel memory sharing. Kernel security module, I thought. No, oh. it's for, uh, memory it's memory deduplication. I don't remember okay. what KSM stands for. I forget what the, yeah. I'm assuming somebody will chime in with that. In the Someone chat. who wrote the docs might chime in. Maybe, we'll see. <laughs> So, um, so we're good to go there. Um, not only because I think I might have that much actual RAM, but also due to overcommitment, um, it'll take care of it all there. So rev storage. Um, so this is an interesting one. Um, so etcd has some fairly strict performance requirements. Like it really wants less than 10 milliseconds of latency. Um, so for whatever reason, and I don't know if this has always existed or it just came to my attention once the Rev IPI process started becoming more prominent, um, but it can cause issues, particularly with deployment. So if we follow these links out, so this one will take us to this page, which we're gonna quickly log into. And once we get to this page, I can close that tab now. Once we get to this page, we will end up finding a link to this article from IBM. And this article from IBM discusses using FIO in order to gauge whether or not your, your storage has enough performance for your, uh, for etcd. Cool. So I'm going to copy this command and let's see if I can find a host that has this on it. So we'll go to the helper node and see what happens. Oh, helper node. Again, yeah, this, this must be running the speed. <laughs> this must be running CentOS because it didn't come up with the uh, the normal subscription manager stuff. Right, yeah. If so, only there was a fast way to check that. So this is running on the same storage, just from a different host. Um, same gigabit connection and all that other stuff. So it should give us an idea of what the um, with, what the expected performance is. And I need to create a directory called test data. And 
and we should allow this to create. And is this a, so this, and if you read through that IBM article, it specifically calls out that they tuned this, you know, size 22 megabytes, byte size of 2300, or I think that's byte size, I don't know. Um, but they specifically tune these parameters for etcd, not for what's the lowest latency, what's the maximum throughputs, right? All right. these other things associated with your storage. Uh, but we're, what we're shooting for here is a minimum of 50 IOPS and a 99th percentile latency of uh, less than 10 milliseconds. So this will run wow. for a, okay. a minute or two. So yeah, so coming from a storage background, um, 10 milliseconds, is both a little and a lot, right? In that um, all flash storage, so SSD, for example, should mm -hmm. be consistently under a millisecond. Um, you know, whereas hybrid storage, so hard drives fronted by flash is usually less than 10, depending on cache. And then hard drives are typically in the 20-ish millisecond range. But all of that is completely pointless depending on your storage system and, and how it does caching and how it does RAID and how it does 99,000 other things. So you can't just say, well, I'm using all hard drives, so therefore it's only going to be less than 20 milliseconds uh, because it might be more, it might be less and mm -hmm. any number of other things. So you see that didn't take long. Um, what we're looking for here is underneath here, uh, you see my 99th percentile is 87. Um, 17. So these are in microseconds. So divide by a thousand and we get 8.7 seconds, millise 8 .7 milliseconds. Nice. Um, so it's actually higher than it normally is for the system. So it could be because I'm running from a different node, one that's already got other stuff going on. It could be any number of things. So after that slight tangent. No, that's relevant. helpful in information. I didn't know you could do that. So relevant tangent, cool. I guess. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get rid of all that stuff. So my rev storage is on the borderline, but it seems to be good enough. Um, 230 gigabytes or more for storage. Um, again, that's going to depend on how big you make those drives. And we must have access to an internet connection. Uh, this is pretty mm -hmm. normal. Makes sense. Yeah, it's IPI. Um, we do. So do we have offline installs for this available yet or not? I think so. I personally okay. have not tested it. I um, haven't either, obviously. So that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Um, so we typically try to. Yeah, it, it might not be at first. Yeah, I don't remember if IPI supports offline or I, I never do offline. I install installations. I just it's not my thing. So yeah. No. Um, so the last one that I have highlighted here um, feels obvious, but at the same time. Um, I actually encountered this initially of whatever network the masters, so the control plane VMs are being deployed to needs to have access to, right? It needs to be able to touch the rev manager API endpoint. Uh, you know, the, the code, the cloud provider inside of OpenShift needs to be able to talk to rev to be able to manage those virtual machines. So if it can't talk to them, bad things happen. And by bad things, I mean, it just doesn't work. So, if you can, and um, I don't see it linked here, the quick start guide, uh, which is linked from the blog post on openshift.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I can do rev and openshift on that site. Let's see if it comes up. Probably not. Uh, uh. I have never had great luck with DuckDuckGo and technical searches. Anyways, <laughs> that, that worked out great. <laughs> you even put in your own name. <laughs> I know. Uh, and Google did even worse, so. Well, you got the site colon blog thingy there. I don't know if that helps it. No, oh, no, no, no. It's not blog.openshift.com anymore. It moved to openshift.com slash blog. Maybe that's the problem. Hey, there we go. There you go. You got to use the right. Uh, yeah. No. Ironically, it's easier for me to remember this and then clicking the link for quick start guide than it is to just remember where the quick start guide is. You um, know, there's this thing called bookmarks. I know. <laughs> you and your technology. I know my fancy technology. <laughs> um, anyway, so... 
the quick start guide here has a handy dandy command that you can run. It's a curl command somewhere down in here. Why am I scrolling when I can search? Um, so you can see there's a curl command that will walk through how to test and make sure that you can access the API endpoints for Rev Manager. That should obviously be executed from the same network as your uh, as you intend to deploy the control plane. Yes. So I'm not going yeah. to test it because I know that mine works. Oh, high confidence. I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, every time I do that, I, I I'm uh, probably going to get bit in the butt now, right? Well, you know, it's a lot. It's it's live. So if you haven't made your sacrifices to the demo gods, now's a good time. I, I did only have <laughs> three cups of coffee this morning, and that was oh. five hours ago. Whoa. Okay. I just finished my like ninth cup of coffee. I make my coffee weak, but yeah. Yeah, I um. So when I used to work in an office and we had coffee available all day, I would drink mm. yeah like eight mm -hmm. nine cups of coffee a day, and then you know you start getting the the caffeine jitters and the the caffeine yeah. sweats and yeah, I had to uh, consciously back off. No, I actually I I weigh my coffee now to keep the uh, caffeine under control. So yeah, I actually drink three liters of very light coffee. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I know we I'm, I'm sure eric will have some uh some rationale or, or something about how you should like the amount of coffee and the amount of water can affect the flavor and because he knows more about coffee he's probably forgotten more about coffee than i've ever known in my life oh well okay i'll have to bring that up with him next time i talk to him like hey you know i do a pour over method yeah, how would he, you do that he is he <laughs> is an aficionado without a doubt there's always one in everybody's team i feel like um, so I skipped over the parts that was just re-verifying all of the requirements. So you right, can see, you know, we confirm that you have know. RAM. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, look. Oh, there's the curl commands. It's actually in here too. Oh, cool. So preparing the network environments. Um, again, I've already done all of this because I just reused the same thing over and over again, but we can take a look at it. So I'm over on the helper node. Uh, and we can Jump see the DNS directory. Yep. I'm gonna cat one of these zone files here. So here's my reverse. Sweet. Um, which we can see has nothing in it, which is perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And if we look at our forwards, uh, so I'm going to be using, where are they? Oh, I know why, because I'm looking at the wrong zones. That'll do it Yeah. every time. Because I actually, it, it needs its own subdomain. So anyways, here's all of our, so this is one of my other domains, CNV. Mm -hmm. um, we can see we have all of our entries in here. And actually, I don't even need that one. This is the one I'm looking for. I'll get there eventually, I swear. <laughs> well, you know, it took us a while to get sound going. <laughs> so, you know, why not DNS too? If yeah. only Christian were online to help us know, with this it, DNS problem, right? He, he he is. I see him in chat. No, so. I know he's in chat. That's why I um, said it. <laughs> So now that I eventually got to the right zone, you can see I have API, which is my 209. I have my wildcard for apps, which is at 211. Um, so the third IP address, which will be 210, we don't need a DNS entry for. And additionally, if you saw in the forward zone, so we have our pointer record in there. And then we don't need one for our wildcard. So we can test this. Um, so dig shorts. I dig shorts. Yeah. <laughs> so we can see if we do our dig command for our, a test uh, wildcard domain against the apps, it comes back with the rights. And we can also do the same thing for our API. And it comes up correctly. Cool. And we'll test our reverse on this one and it comes up. So theoretically we should be good. And if we really want to, we can test it from over here to increase the size of this one. And it comes up correctly. So we verified our DNS is set up correctly. I'm not going to do the ARP thing because I know my IPs are not in, in use. 
Uh, we tested DNS. Um, so I'm going to skip doing this for the moment. Um, so what we're talking about here is setting up the CA certificate for Rev. Um, okay. And I, I do that um, because at least on my uh, laptop here, I've, I've actually already done this. Um, yeah, so you won't get the... Yeah, yeah. so what this is, um, so if we go here and it's just walking through the command line version of doing this. But if you browse to the main window here for Red Hat virtualization, you'll have this CA certificate that you can pull and then trust. And you can see mm -hmm. it's already installed as a certificate authority. So I don't actually need to do that for mine. Um, yeah, yes. and you can see it's just walking through, adding that as a uh, trusted certificate. I don't need to generate a, an SSH private key. I got that one you covered. Got that, obviously, because you just logged into a box. Yep. So pulling the installation program, that's the one that's over here. I guess I can I already authenticate it in here, right? So if we come to the SNAZI cluster manager. Now all I'm doing is looking for our Red Hat virtualization. And you can see it offers me to download the installer. I did this yesterday. Um, I'm not going to do it again. But you can select which operating system you want, blah, blah, blah. Good news is you only need it once. Um, and then I do need the, the pull secret. So there is a, um, I don't know how much it lags, but Brew does have the OpenShift tools on there. So you can do a Brew install on yeah. macOS. Uh, I, I I want to say that it's part of the build process that they push those out, but I do not know for certain. Oh, I would update it now, but it would take far too long and my laptop would try and take off uh, thanks to throttling. Uh, question in the chat, what version of Rev is this on? It 439. Is four, or 439, sorry. Yep. So 438, 437 or 438, it's in the docs um, somewhere, is the minimum version that works. Got it. So at this point, we're ready to create our install config.yaml. So let's come over here. YAML, 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 YAML. So standard OpenShift install um, file, you see I'm just passing the directory equals uh, ORV, our cluster name inside of there. So it's going to ask the normal set of questions, which public key do I want to use? I'm installing to overt. Um, note mm -hmm. that overt is the upstream for Red Hat virtualization. So we're using overt. Uh, so it will only ask me this information once. Um, then it creates, after it asks it the first time, it creates the uh, that file that I deleted at the very beginning, which is the um, home directory dot slash overt slash overt config dot YAML. And we can see if we look at the help, it helpfully gives us the template to use here. Very nice. So is it trusted locally? Yes, it is. Um, certificate bundle. So this is... Um, if we come back here and we download our certificate, and then we copy our certificate, this is what it's asking for. So the rationale here is we, even though my laptop trusts the certificate, once we deploy OpenShift and the cloud provider, right? So it, basically the pods that are interacting with Rev are up and running. Well, they need to, they, they don't trust the same certificates as my desktop. Right. Uh, so we have to provide that bundle and then tell them to trust it, which the installer does automatically, but we have to provide the certificate to it. Um, so that's exactly what we're going to do here. Let's provide that. Just happened here. Did it do some of it and then stop? 
I don't know. Control W. Do anything? Mm -hmm. Oh, Mac OS, you you broke. <laughs> Did it fail you? Wow, I've never seen that app before. You just pasted it, right? Like nothing fancy. Yeah. Ah. All right. Thanks, Mac that's, OS. That's weird. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go with this one then. <laughs> <laughs> Copy that. Okay. So yeah, the the odd paste problem. Never seen that one before. It's good stuff. You know. Um... The um <clears throat> let's try this again and see what happens. Eek. There we go. Yay. The paste works. There. So one thing to note, if you saw, it says two blank lines to end. So you have to hit return three times at the end. Mm -hmm. So over at engine username, I am super secure and sophisticated. It is admin. Good. Default. If you don't tell us our password, we'll only get half of it right. I know, right? Uh oh. oh. Certificate signed by unknown authority. But I just gave it to you. Oh, fine. We won't trust the certificate then. Jeez. I know. Well, wait. This, this is running on your laptop, though. That is weird. Uh huh. So this is basically saying ignore the, the error when you right. tell it it's untrusted. Yeah. So if, if 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 you did this right, or if what if for whatever reason this thing were valid, I, I don't know why it's signed by an unknown authority, then you would not get a series of pop ups that say, "Hey, this this is on your session." Yeah. So as I'm sitting here thinking about it, um, so it is a self signed certificate that I have chosen to um, trust. Mm -hmm. So I think what it is is I need to pass it the signing authorities certificate so you need to up, uh, rather yeah, than the certificate yeah, yeah, yeah. itself got it okay. so it, it's more yeah it's more effort than i'm going to go to right now yeah that makes sense uh, no so Push yes it, it's uh to, yeah no it's not trusted i don't care that it's not trusted um thank you it's for the warning right that it will be house. insecure yeah um, so at this point, it asks for the username, it asks for the password, it actually connects to our cluster or our uh, rev manager. And at this point, it is offering me, you know, telling me wh what pick, resources do you want to use? Pick a cluster, any cluster. So cluster two is our destination. We're going to use our one and only storage domain. We're going to use our lab network. So our internal IP. Um, so this is the API virtual IP, right? Which you got so, from your zone file. Yep. So remember, this is the one that we want to resolve to API. So the 209. Mm -hmm. So the DNS virtual IP, this is the one that doesn't need a DNS record. And then our ingress virtual IP, which is the wildcard apps. And then our base domain. which is simply lab, again, super creative. Mm -hmm. you know, Cluster name right. is ORV. And my poll secret. Copy pasta. One of these has what I need. There we go. So now we should have, if we look inside of our, uh, let's get rid of the, yeah, save yourself some get rid of that thing. Now, if we look inside of here, we have our install config. Awesome. So all I did was um, tell it to ignore the secret. Yeah, the pull secret. Mm -hmm. Not that anybody would actually sit here and copy out all like 300 characters of that thing, but you know. 
that's way more than that. But yeah. I know. <laughs> uh, so luck. pretty straightforward trade. It's like every other install config that's out there. Mm -hmm. The difference being our platform down here. Right. Um, so you can see it uses the UID here, uses our network name, basically everything that we need in order to get the, uh, the cluster up and running. One thing to note, as always, with your networking, if you need to change the sliders to not conflict, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yes. And then um, I think we're good to go. So as always, I will um, make a copy of this. Because okay. when you run the when you run the oh, uh, right. cluster create, it consumes it. I like how we we call it consuming. But <laughs> It eats it, and it does not give you anything back. Um, so I'm going to make a, a copy of that to have for posterity's stake. And then we'll kick it off. So one thing to note, um, this time I am inside of the directory. So I'm inside of the ORV directory, so I'm not going to specify the uh, domain cool. or the directory, rather. Yeah. So I am going to use log level debug. Um, this is mostly so that we have something to look at for the next few minutes instead of just staring at a screen doing absolutely nothing mm -hmm. um, but, from this perspective. But staring at screens doing nothing is what we do all day. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no. It's like watching paint um, dry or grass yeah, grow. Yeah. Uh, actually, I do need my grass to start growing here soon. So, oh, you know what I didn't do? Um, let's uh -oh. go ahead and... Get out of that. Because I stopped following the directions and just started doing it. Um, there is down here somewhere, admin that internal, blah, 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 deploy the cluster. So on one of these pages, public key, yep, 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 yep. I think it was on the previous page. So way down here at the bottom, are they exporting the environment variables? This is important. Who would have thought, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is what this environment variable variable is what's going to tell the installer which template to use when we are doing this installation. Got it. Um, so if we had not done this, the installation still would have has would have gone through. Um, it still would have done it, its thing. But no what template. it would do is it would reach out and it would pull down the image template. Then it would create or the uh, the QCow. Then it would create a new template. And then it would use that without that customization for things like the disk size that we had added in. Which are vitally important given the nature of the environment we're in. So yes, please yeah. use these variables. So we are going to go ahead and do it the correct way. And our template name, if I remember correctly, is... Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, copy and paste. All right. And just to make sure so, it didn't get far enough to try and create anything over here. Uh, nope. Cool. And nope. All right. So now okay. we will do it again. Um, remember how I said it was a good idea to create that uh, backup for the install config? Mm-hmm. So in the uh, in the logs, someone says you could use a sim link into the installer to keep it from being gobbled up, just as a tip. Oh, that's an interesting tip. Yeah, no, that um, that'd be helpful. Yeah, I, I six oh one half a dozen the other. Um, yeah, I mean whatever you want to do. I, that's you know. one command instead of my what three. So yeah, however you want to use your inodes is up to you. <laughs> um. So where'd we go? So OpenShift install create cluster log level debug. We have our install config in here and now we should be good to go, hopefully. Sweet. So we'll let it go for a minute. And then once it gets to the point of cloning virtual machines, we'll switch over. 
yeah, we'll see some fun. So normally, if we were just letting it run without setting that uh, environment variable to use the templates, we would mm -hmm. see it would pause as it downloaded the image locally. It would then go through the process of uploading that disk like we did manually, go through the process of creating a template like we did manually, mm -hmm. um, so, or creating a virtual machine and then cloning it to a template. Um, instead, because we did all of that stuff for it, you can see here um, down below in the logs, we're relying on uh, Terraform here to create various virtual machines. So master one, master two, master zero, and bootstrap, which conveniently we have over here. Let me make this a little bit bigger as well. Thank you. So you can see here we have our master zero, one, two, and bootstrap. Awesome. Keep it going. So I'll, I'll delve a little bit into um, looking at what's going on in the boot process here. So. I use just for sheer sake of convenience, no VNC to connect to the consoles of these because it'll open it in the browser. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we look at this, it'll boot and it'll tell us what our IP address is here. So oh, 110. Nice. So now I want to come here. You're still frozen. <laughs> <laughs> Watch, it's yeah. gonna start. It's just gonna, that is gonna finish pasting in any moment now. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Or, and it's, oops, I'm going to have to. Oh, oh, oh. oh, is this one of those things you log into all the time? Yep. Man. So all I'm doing is SSHing as core. So remember when we did the create install config, it asked for the SSH key. Um, mm -hmm. So it associates that SSH key with the core user on the host. And when I connect in, yes, I do. It drops me in as core, and now I can use journal control, which it helpfully provides for me, to sit here and watch it bootstrap its thing. And we can see over here, we are now at the stage of waiting up to 20 minutes for the Kubernetes API to come up. Right, awesome. So bootstrap is, well, bootstrapping. Um, another thing that we can kind of look at, I see it's, going about it all over again. So one thing that um, some people don't know, I, I didn't know this until the last few weeks actually. Um, so you can sudo over to roots and then you can use Cree control to look at the pods or the containers rather that are running on the host. Mm -hmm. So Rev IPI uses the same uh, technology as the uh, bare metal IPI process when it comes to the load balancer and all that other stuff. So you notice we didn't con configure HA proxy or yeah, we didn't configure yeah. SRV records or any of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so it uses keep alive D to pass around, right? To keep those IPs on the nodes that they are supposed to be on and up and working as the cluster does its thing. So if you're having issues, as you're uh, installing the cluster, you can simply sudo um, and then use Cree control to look at the logs for these. Nice. And keep alive D is that one. So you can see it's doing its thing. Or I could look at uh, etcd, you know, if I want to look and see what etcd is up to, DNS. Um, so Core DNS is what's being used for the MDNS responder. Um, awesome as a project. I love that yeah. project, yeah. So Keep Alive D is basically maintaining the IP address that then points to the Core DNS service. At least I think that's how it works. Um, and then etcd then looks at that to get its information. Um, so one thing that I have found out, and um, actually thanks to Christian, is that with 4.4, OpenShift 4.4, the boot process or bootstrap process changed. Um, so it used to be that when it bootstraps, it would, um, basically the bootstrap would start and then it would wait for the masters to come online and then the masters would start etcd and then bootstrap would connect to that etcd and do its thing, right? So it would stand up all the services against that etcd and then just hand over the services to the masters. With 4.4, it uses the etcd uh, operator and it'll instantiate a single node instance of etcd on the bootstrap itself 
Cool. Then when the masters come online, it uses the operator to scale that to three. So it adds two master nodes. Right. Then it scales down to two. So it removes the original bootstrap and then it scales back up to three, adding the last master. Brilliant. Uh, so what we're doing now, and you can see this is just scrolling by these numbers um, mm -hmm. as it's going through and doing this, it's waiting for the masters to finish booting. Um, so what's happened at this point, and if we're fast about it, we can come over here and see how these masters are rebooting. Yep. Basically, the masters started, they looked to bootstrap, they got their ignition config, uh, now they're rebooting to basically do their thing. When the masters come back, we'll stop seeing this scroll by. Depending on how fast your network or uh, your environment is, this can take um, anywhere from a few hundred to, uh, on mine, at one point I had it way overloaded and it got up to like 4,000 tries of this or something wow. like that. Um, no. But eventually it'll proceed. But yeah, it's a timeout, right? Like, what did it say, 20 minutes? Yeah, actually, we should have moved beyond that point. Okay, never mind. Sorry. Let me find the right one of these things. So the Kubernetes API came up. Basically, came that's up. indicating that Bootstrap has at least initiated the initial or created the initial Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're waiting really for okay. Bootstrap itself to finish. Um, so you can see this went relatively quickly. Yeah. Testament to your home lab. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and still Testament going Testament to here. all being local. <laughs> Yeah, that's the, and it's funny, right? Cause you know, I know there's a lot of people who, you know, oh, I can't do a home lab because I don't have 10 gigabit network or I don't have all these resources or anything like that. Literally all of this from a storage perspective, it's running remotely one gigabit NFS to a single NVMe drive. Nice. Right. So yes, it is NVMe, but it's, it's also uh, kneecapped because it has VDO on top of it. Mm. Um, and then that box is running off of an old desktop. Um, it's running like an ancient uh, Xeon. An ancient Xeon? Yeah. Like, um, I think the nice, past mark nice. score is something like 8,000. It's five-ish years old. Okay. Um, hmm. So in the background here, notice it stopped scrolling all of these messages, essentially indicating that it's moved on to the next step. Um, so the masters have rebooted. It's now trying to deploy all the various services underneath. Um, and what we'll see is this stanza of four will start repeating itself here in a little bit. Uh, and we're waiting for all four of them to say ready. Ready, ready, ready. Yeah. And they bounce up and down, um, especially I think it's the controller manager and the API server will bounce back and forth a little bit between pending and ready. And yeah, see, does not exist, running not ready. Uh, so this usually takes a few iterations uh, as it's going through. Nice. But if we look over here, eventually it'll, um, even while it's still doing this, so it isn't fully up, it will go forward and deploy the worker nodes. Yeah, there's the there first one. There you go. Yeah. So it's just in the process of doing its thing. Um, notice that the bootstrap is now gone, or it should be in the process of going. Um, out of the way. Okay, so we're waiting for bootstrap to complete. I usually, in order to prevent uh, yet another console window from freezing, I try and disconnect from it before it deletes the VM out from underneath it because Mac OS, for some reason, holds onto those sessions forever. It doesn't time out. Yeah. Probably it, something I'm doing, but... Well, no, uh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, uh, Mac OS networking is one of those things where it's like, are you punking me right now? Or is this for real a problem? I feel like sometimes. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've, like I have, uh, you know, a wired network that has priority over my wireless network. I can't tell you how many times, like I've all of a sudden just swapped over to a different interface for no reason. All right. Yeah. And then, yeah, like it, it, yeah, yeah, it's I, the same network, but it's wired versus wireless. And yeah, it's annoying to me, but that's how it goes sometimes. It's it's funny to me that, um, so I, I don't know, I've been, I've been in IT for 20 years now. Um, this is the first time I've ever not used Windows for my primary desktop. 
Oh, really? Um, I've just always, you know, I worked with the government. Well, Windows was the oh, actually, yeah. actually, that's not true. I used Solaris. Um, I used Solaris <laughs> back in the early 2000s. Solaris and Windows. Um, you know, Solaris 8. Uh, that was that was lots of fun. You remember oh, the the Spark yeah. stations? I had a, I had an Ultra 60. Nice. Um, you know, way back when. So, uh, you notice it moved on over here. So it's it going yes. through. This is Bootstrap. Yep. Yeah. Deploying all the various services. So adding in all the various configs, et cetera. So you can see here, sending bootstrap finished event, tearing down temporary bootstrap control plane. Mm -hmm. So we'll go ahead and exit out of that guy. And if we switch back over in just a moment, we'll see it register that. And then just a moment later, we'll see it destroy the bootstrap node. Aw, poor bootstrap. Hey, it, it served its purpose. It, it did its it job. Did, it did good. Valiantly, uh, we will ship it off like a Viking funeral. Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> there was a there was a series of Tom Clancy books I actually read uh, when I was in the military and during deployments, and it was like cyberspace became like something that you actually like interacted with physically, kind of thing. It's not like a Matrix thing, but like is that like close? Uh um what, what's um uh, what's the one ernest klein they just made a movie out of it um why can i not think of the name of this it's like the one that's set in the 80s ernest klein 80s movie set in the 80s um i got nothing uh ready player one that's right no it's not like that well maybe a little bit um but yeah like you could actually go into this environment and uh, like you were physically attached to it somehow, basically. And it, it was a world within a world essentially. And the books were based off like a police force. Uh, like they had to police this cyber world. And, you know, it's like when something dies there, where does it, where does it go? Right. Like, yeah. Th yeah. So that was always a interesting question I had in the back of my head, like, Oh, they're gone. So what does that actually mean? <laughs> <laughs> Is the person gone too? That um, was never clear. While while you were uh, telling me about that, it it did the bootstrap yeah, did completed. Finish. Yep, and now it's scrolling through. And question in the chat: um, Were you, you, there's only one core on this laptop with NVMe storage? Uh, so it's not a laptop, actually. It's okay. um, it's a Desktop. Dell something or other. Okay. Now there's a whole bunch of talk about Ready Player One in the movie. Yeah, uh, the so you can't treat the book in the movie as like they have the same premise, mm -hmm. not the same. Otherwise, yeah, they they are very different entities, and mm -hmm. you can't watch the movie expecting it to be like the book or vice versa at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you can see this is a it's a Dell Precision T seventeen hundred laptop. Um, wow. Yeah, I think I found like a, a coupon for like 40% off or something to Dell Refurbished a few years nice. ago. And that's yeah. where I ended up with it. I need to find one um, of those. <laughs> so it's doing a, uh, let's see if it'll tell me on this. Um, so they're an E3 1271 V3. So nothing spectacular by any stretch of the imagination. Um, this is literally a repurposed desktop. Mm -hmm. Um it does have a uh, an NVIDIA K2000, I think, in it, which Plex uses for hardware transcoding. Works oh, great. okay, cool. Um, so, and it does have 32 gigs of RAM. Um, but if we look at the storage side over here, we have our VDO device. And you can see it's 103 physical gigabytes on disk and it's assessed over a terabyte or mm -hmm. right out of terabyte. So, you know, the whole video deduplication and all that other stuff, um, it works really, really well. And then inside of there, um, it's just using LVM inside of there to create my logical volume. So I actually have two logical volumes. One is um, so SHE self-hosted engine, and then the other one is one that I use for uh, OpenShift virtualization. 
I see your comment about using, uh, using cockpit home, Christian. Cockpit. I, yeah. mm-hmm. I use it um, for storage stuff. I find it to be easier. Um, networking, it doesn't always do what I want it to do. So I usually have to go in and, and redo it. But uh, for the storage stuff, I find it pretty easy. Um, I find it uh, the virtual machine and the, the Podman stuff to be very, very handy. Um, if you yeah. have a bunch of random pods that you need to just have running in the background somewhere, right? Like I, I have on one of the boxes behind me, it's a Fedora, uh, Raspberry Pi three, and it's just running, you know, a handful of pods for me. You know, I don't need the full blown Kubernetes experience sitting on a Raspberry Pi. I just need to run a few pods, set it up through cockpit. It was easy enough. Off you go. So all I'm doing is um, while it's finishing the deployment, uh, you see it's at 98% deploying the cluster. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to connect into the cluster and take a look around. So all I've done here is um, this export command that I'm executing is literally the same export command that it'll spit out at the end, telling you to right. use the kube config to connect in, et cetera. Use the correct kube config or yep. you'll be in someone else's cluster and I know it or not really. <laughs> hmm. There we go. So we can see our six nodes here, three workers. It's still going through its thing. I've only been online for 70 seconds. So we can see our various CSRs. I guess I could approve that one, although it should approve it eventually, automatically. Hmm. There, we'll help it out. So we got all our nodes added. It's just going through, what are you doing? It's still at 98% complete. So we can do OC get cluster operator. Um, so we're waiting on monitoring samples that one may or may not work. There is a, oh, so the, the yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that one, that one doesn't come up until after all the others. It's one of the last ones, I think. Um, so the registry won't come up because I don't feel like looking up the uh, command to patch the registry operator. Oh, never mind, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> So there, the registry will come up. If you if you save your history long enough, you'll get exactly uh, it, what you need out of it. It's Catalina. It's Z shell. It actually keeps it for you see. For I'm a at long time. Yeah, twenty seven eighty eight. <laughs> so I'm still getting used to the um, Z shell is case insensitive for like double tab. Um, mm. So that that still throws me for a loop because I have the habit of using um, you know the double tab as a a crutch. Yes, same. So yeah, same problems. I feel you. If we check our cluster version, yeah, it's still doing its thing. So it takes it a few minutes. This is dependent on who knows what things. I'm sure it's internet, CPU, and storage. Um, I always get a kick out of the times when it says 100% complete, but still waiting on things. Mike, do you not understand what 100% means? Well, you know, 100% is a relative term. <laughs> you know. <laughs> 100% of what? What do you need to be 100%? Just this? Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, full completeness is uh, appreciated. I do like the fact that it does tell you, like, we're waiting on some operators here, right? Like, it's not like just telling you, oh, still at 98%, still at 98%, still at 98%, actually tells you what's going on. So you can go look. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you notice the output of that, um, so if we do OC get, um, come on, cluster version. So that's the same as what this thing is scrolling by. Yeah. Nice. So ironically, this is usually once it gets to this point is when it takes the longest. If we switch back over to Red Hat Virtualization Manager here. We can see all of our nodes are up and working, doing their thing. Doop, 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 doop. 
And you can see now that it's at this stage, my disk IO and my network is settled considerably. So right. yeah. again, all of this is over gigabit. It's not ultra fast. Um, latency is decent and that's what's important. Oh, this yeah. is CentOS, what do you know? Um, I guess it predates me working at Red Hat. So CentOS makes sense. So while we're waiting on this paint to dry, <laughs> how's the weather there in Michigan? So <laughs> it's it's been up and down. We had like a nice-ish Friday, Saturday, and then like the bottom fell out. And like we haven't had snow this month. That's encouraging. But last month we had snow like the last week of the month. We well, you know, we're only five days into the month of May, so there's still right. time. There's still time. It's 51 right now, high of 52. It's cloudy. It's like that pre-spring niceness that we've already had like twice already this year. We just needed to go full spring on us now. You know, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, while we were testing audio, I don't know if you heard me rambling about the weather here. It was almost 90 degrees over the weekend. Oh my God. Was, yeah. It was, uh, Wow, that's too much, too soon. Yeah, and my, my son, who is an avid indoorsman, was not happy about it at oh, all. Oh, I bet. Yeah, no, uh, that would be... Like, I, I, <laughs> I, I worked in the desert for a very long time. I really appreciate air conditioning, and I do not like heat. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's part of the reason why we moved up here was because the summers were getting brutal. And, uh, yeah, it was no fun, so... Now we don't have to worry about that. We just got to dig snow every once in a while. It does get old. Like April, late April snows, that gets old. All right. Look at those guys. Uh, yeah. OpenShift samples I'm less concerned about. Kube API server. And, you know, that's important. Yeah. So one trick I also learned from uh, about troubleshooting these things is you can you can find the GitHub repository that is the source for the operator, which the developers will often include a lot of information about how to troubleshoot and check on and look into and configure even um, what's mm -hmm. going on with it. So it's OCADM release uh, info dash dash commits, I think is the, uh... and then if we do, For our specific operator, you can see this is the GitHub repo where it came from. And if you really care, the specific commit that was used for this build. And now I can come over here. That is that's what I get for highlighting something else. Thanks for helping me out, Mac OS. Well, you know, that paste will eventually happen sometime. <laughs> <laughs> so now we can see our Oh, cluster cube API server operator. And if we scroll down in here, you can see a bunch of stuff about that particular operator. So I found this to be a particularly helpful, you know, shortcut. So here, let's see what's going on inside of there. <laughs> that worked out well. Okay. Yeah. So clearly. So there, here we go. So installer controller degraded. So it's still doing whatever it does. Oh, did we finish? Hey, it finished. Okay, good. Awesome. All right, so let's browse to our, I don't need that. I know what that is. So I need our kube admin password and an unused tab. And I will browse to the incorrect URL. It's always funny to watch people like, oops, did the wrong thing. And like, when you think about it, how many times it actually happens every day, like oops, pasted the wrong thing or oops, went to the wrong site or something, right? Always amazes me how many mistakes that experts make just naturally and are just like, oh yeah, duh. Yeah, well, what's the, um, uh, the, the 
it's not Dunning Kruger, but it's the the trough of disillusionment or something like that of, you know, only beginners think that they're experts. Experts think that they're beginners. Right. Yeah, exactly. So as you can see, even though it's done deploying, there's still a few things in here that seem to be settling. Not all the pods are completely active. No, um, but that's kind of normal. So if we come down here to our machines, you can see they're all provisioned as nodes. So they're all up. Yep. It's still doing its thing a little bit in the background here. We can see our machine sets. We have our worker inside of here. Nice. If I want to. I can dig in a little bit. I can do things like add a new one. Mm -hmm. Which you can see it popped up right away over here. And if I switch back over, we can see that it should appear momentarily. I might have to force the refresh. There it is. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, easy, straightforward. Boom. Simple. You Does what it's machine. supposed to do. There you go. So we'll let that do its thing for a few minutes. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's OpenShift to the OpenShift on Rev up and running. I, I see that. Uh, yeah, I Dunning Dunning Kruger Dunning -Kruger knowledge Kruger of Dunning. Knowledge. Yeah, yeah. That's... Yeah, I have no doubt. I am. Uh, <laughs> I'm at best an armchair psychologist, which means that I'm the worst kind of psychologist. Yes, you're you're the one I can't talk to. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, like how long would it take for, you know, just adding one node to take just uh, it takes 10, 15, 20 minutes tops. No, I mean, it shouldn't be that long. Right. I mean, in my environments, um, so literally all we're doing is creating the new, uh, VM based off of an image. Oh, shit, there it is. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> it basically it finished creating the based off of the template. Now it'll yeah, boot it. VM it that. will talk to the control plane. So it'll talk to a machine config operator after it boots, um, so it'll probably go through another reboot and then it'll join the cluster just as you would expect. So machine config operator. Is it you that loves that so much or someone else? Um that Christian and Eric. That's that's their, that's their specialty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was uh like a three hundred chat or three hundred message chat trying yeah. to uh explore some of the nuances in there. Yeah, it's it's a big one, but it does a whole lot of cool shit stuff a whole lot of cool stuff provision to reboot in progress man look at that yeah yeah so that thing is plugging along yep it does its thing um like i said it, it's it's largely dependent on the virtual infrastructure that's underneath it which uh, again you've said is meager right like <laughs> yeah I, I mean nvme is it's really nice um in that sure it's it's ultra low latency but you also saw at the beginning because of the added layer on top mine isn't ultra low latency right nvme mm -hmm. is normally like if it were just uh being used as an os disk for a, a rel machine or whatever it would probably be like a couple hundred microseconds of latency at most but right. with everything added on top network latency video latency nfs latency you know it's a couple of milliseconds so mm -hmm. it's not great but it's adequate adequate he just stood up a whole cluster and <laughs> expanded it in a matter of minutes adequate yeah, it, it doesn't take long so um there that was 1440 if we scroll all the way back up here and let's do this the smart way yes smarter not harder so if we scroll back up here 1417 14. so yeah. 23 minutes wow dang so i'll take that yeah, no, that's good. That's good time. I mean, considering everything you just did, yeah. So, Chris, what are we going to do for the next hour and 13 minutes? Well, uh, <laughs> I, there's a wild turkey walking outside my window distracted me. Sorry. Um, I, I hear you sing, so. Oh, there. Look, the new oh, notes. do done. I sing? Yeah. I don't sing. La, 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 la. No, I don't sing at all um there there's all our nodes ready status role worker all added in dang that's awesome man so what else can you do now it's all just open shift from this point forward right like yeah yeah so drive, it's you can drive your rev through open shift exactly um so it's literally like any of the other ipi experiences um 
I, I have not had the time yet to explore and experiment with creating additional machine sets, et cetera, to see if we can do things like, um, can I create customized node types with uh, a different template? Um, so maybe I want to use Rev's GPU pass-through feature and create right. some GPU enabled um, uh, nodes. You know, I, I haven't gone through and explored all of those things. I work under the assumption that they'll just work because that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's just open shift at this point. Um, it, it does what it's supposed to do, which is the beauty of it. Right. Mm, indeed. Yeah. So the, the, the power of open shift here is that <clears throat> that machine config operator and the, the, just the, wealth of knowledge we dump into the product right like we learn from all of our customers and pass that knowledge along and you know we also pass it upstream you know when we can to help upstream projects as well what are those two busted pods <laughs> i don't know they must not be important it must not be um uh, no. something with the console that's strange that's very weird console <laughs> Console seems to be doing its thing. Yeah, like that's normal looking console. So I few see a few hmm. comments in the uh, in the chat over here. What's the difference with VMware? Um, so once VMware IPI is a thing, it should be basically the same. Yeah, it's just another um, when when you saw the list of places you could install it in the installer, VMware would just be another option. Yeah. So one one thing to note that um, one a, a uh, important feature that did not get deployed as a part of this is the dynamic storage provisioner. Um, mm. So you can use the overt storage provisioner. Uh, let's see, overt open shift e shift extensions. Um, so you can deploy the storage, the dynamic storage provisioner, and it will create the disks inside of the storage domain. Um, so that is definitely an option um, in order to add that in. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it, it's, you know, VMware um, with UPI, the dynamic storage provisioner that it creates is the quote unquote old one. Um, so it's the non CSI version. Okay. Um, what VMware lovingly calls the cloud native storage provider is the CSI compliant one. And that one, um, I don't think are installer provisions yet. I haven't tried it with 4.4, so it it may, but it didn't before. Hmm. I don't know what's going on here with this thing. Yeah, that's, that's preempted in order to admit critical pod. All right then. Well, that's weird. I wonder if uh, what critical pod is being preempted, even though the console is still working. <laughs> so if we look, um, so CPU 64, memory 97. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So that um, so one thing to note again, the default here is um, if we look at our master nodes. That's not what I wanted. If we look at our master nodes, we're going to end up with VMs that have eight gigs of RAM. Um, so again, production, we would want um, 16 gigs of RAM there because yeah. otherwise we end up with things like, well, our memory is basically uh, yeah. extinguished on our node here. Or if you had an operator that might be memory intensive, game over. Yeah. Yeah. So you see eighty five percent. So if I had to guess, it's a it's a memory thing that's causing yeah. those to be to have issues. Okay. Um, that makes so sense. that remember those uh, those the, these things here. Yeah. Those, yeah. Those are important. Very, turns out. Yeah. Very important. So yeah. you can see master but mem and you master would CPU. your setup if you did that, and we yeah. wouldn't want that. So if you're deploying into production and not. Uh, not into your home lab for a Twitch stream. Make sure you set the environment <laughs> variables to use the correct <laughs> amount of memory and the correct number of CPUs. Yeah, that's okay. Cool, man. The the um, I'm trying to think what else we can show people. That's cool. Uh, like, could you manage any of the network pieces through OpenShift? I don't think so, right? Um, so I, I guess that depends on what you mean by network pieces. Um, so it is not 
like the underlying rev network pieces. No. So yeah. it, it's not aware of, right. So we're not going to be able to create, um, you know, additional VLAN networks. We're not going to okay. be able to create additional VNIC profiles, um, that type of stuff. So, oh, another thing to note, um, there is currently an outstanding bug or BZ slash RFE where mm -hmm. um, as it stands today, the network name and the VNIC profile name must match. Um, so if you have a network with more than one VNIC profile and you don't want to use the default one, um, you have to have to create the, the default name. Someone is asking in chat, can Rev see the containers on the nodes? No. Um, it cannot, not no. to my knowledge. Um, although I'm going to check because I honestly haven't checked. Mm. Well, that'd be interesting. And we can see, yeah. Containers. So that, um, I believe, comes down to the guest uh, integration, the guest agents. Um, right. Um, but from a virtualization perspective, you know, we should probably point out there's uh, Red Hat virtualization and now there is also OpenShift virtualization, which uh, doesn't, you know, to me, it doesn't muddy the waters that much, but for others, it might, if you want to talk about that a little bit, where you would use one versus the other, how they complement each other uh, and where best, you know, or not where best, to, but, you know, how would you make the determination of when to use what? Yeah. Um, so if you didn't see the announcement or any of the chatter that was going on during summits um, or here at the very beginning of the session, I think we talked about it a little bit. Um, so the, the feature formerly known as container native virtualization is now OpenShift virtualization. So aside from the rebranding, it's basically exactly the same. Um, mm -hmm. It is a, a again a feature of OpenShift, both both OKE and OCP, um, that enables you to deploy virtual machines to your OpenShift cluster. Right. So at the low level, at the technical level, what we're talking about is KVM virtual machines running in pods, running in containers. Um, at the the level that you know, generally speaking, our developers and applications teams care about, it's VMs and containers running side by side inside of the OpenShift cluster. And at that level, to your point earlier, yes, you can do things like, um, you know, manipulate through Multis, the underlying network config, you can change those, you can add those as needed for your virtual machines. Um, so the use case here is, um, I usually bucket it into two things, although it is certainly not limited to those two things. Um, so one is, if I have an application that is um, deployed as containers or, or much of it is deployed as containers, but I still have some VM dependencies, um, I usually pick on virtual machines or uh, database servers rather. Okay. Um, you know, DBAs were hard enough to convince to go virtual in the first place. Right. Never mind convincing them to try and go containerized. So now I can bring my virtual machine into the virtual machine itself into a container and then have it deployed and managed on OpenShift and consumed just like any other container. Mm -hmm. um, so the other one is for application components that are already, they're virtual machines, but they're really already being treated like containers. Right. Um, you could so install this, this app on any machine, just give it the right class machine and off it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of the, um, and I'll probably show my naive and my my uh, ignorance slash inexperience with OpenStack, but I always think of this as being kind of similar to the OpenStack experience of, you know, OpenStack is uh, quota enforced API based consumption of virtual machines, mm -hmm. right? OpenStack is the same thing for containers. So if I'm treating that virtual machine just like a container anyways, and I want those two applications to integrate, well, I can, or those two application components to directly integrate on the platform, I can use container native, excuse me, OpenShift virtualization. Mm -hmm. Eventually, someday I'll stop doing that. I think it was Reese the other day and our chat was like, yeah, I finally yeah. hit the day where I don't type yum. I now type DNF by default. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, I saw that the other day. No, it's going to be a hard. So for me, it was. Uh, you know, because remember, I came from the community side into Red Hat. So it was Kubevert. No, now it's CNV. Now it's OpenShift virtualization. So, well, like so for me, it's just this constantly changing thing. It's still based on Kubevert. Yeah, but, Kubevert is know, still the upstream. Yeah, it's still the upstream thing. But we've changed our product or project name of it so many times uh, enough that I know that it's just 
OpenShift virtualization now, and it was referred to as CNV, and it's still all kubevert under the hood. So it makes yeah. me happy. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's ever changing, and it's interesting to me. Um, I usually I don't have a cluster up where I could walk through bits and pieces. Actually, I shouldn't do that because Reese will be going through a lot of this stuff. But there's some right. really yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. There's some really cool aspects of it. Um, no, the I've, the containerized I've, data importer does some cool stuff of you know, point it at a URL for a, a virtual disk and it'll ingest that disk, including, you know, if it's coming in as QCOW2, it'll convert it to the format that it needs, you know? If, um, so there's lots of lots of stuff that it can do there. And I can pull that at disk image from S3, from HTTP, from any number of other things as well. All with just an annotation on a PVC. Yeah, it's wild. So yeah, it, there, there is a statement here in chat. It feels weird to put VMs into pods, especially if the pods are running in VMs too, double vert, et cetera. And then, oh yeah, bare metal nodes too. So yeah, like how did you, how do you think about that in this world? You know, I can put this VM now really kind of wherever I need it, wherever I want it in my infrastructure. If I have OpenShift and I have, you know, Red Hat virtualization, I've got virtualization in two places. So, yeah. So the way I usually talk about it, you know, I, I see the comment of it feels weird to put VMs into pods is mm -hmm. what is a container? Well, a container is a, a, you know, kernel level process isolation of, well, whatever that process is. So maybe that process is, um, you know, Python or Java or mm -hmm. Bash. Node, well, whatever, yeah. Yeah. In the case of KVM, and literally all I've done here is SSH into one of my rev nodes. And then I just did a PS dash EF on and grep for QMU. No. This is my virtual machine. This one is one of the worker nodes, right? It's just a process. Right. So there's nothing that says that I can't take these tools. So QMU, KVM, and Libvirt, and the other mm -hmm. things that I need to instantiate and manage these VMs, put them into a container image, and then just instantiate the same process inside of a container. Yeah, and have it scheduled. That's Containers kind of the processes, basically. And exactly, you know, it's it makes sense to a lot of people in that sense um, when you break it down like that. But still, there's going to be you know some kind of determination on you know the, the the user side that has to say right like well, you know, we moved some stuff into you know our containers. Well, now maybe we should put the VMs into containers, or you know, we've got everything we want out of. Uh, our container space, what else can we do with it? And then that's when you're like, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, I've got this bespoke, con you know, thing that is, you know, horribly out of date, but I can't touch it because it's been written and now it's doing all of its fancy stuff uh, in the background. And, uh, you know, it's one of those special nodes that often snowflake, you know, these things happened kind of things. So now I could take that node and make a, a disk image of it and put it in my OpenShift cluster and, you know, or put it in Rev. And then I can worry about it on that platform, not necessarily the the, the aging physical, you know, hardware that it's sitting on in the corner of my data center. Um, yeah. That I think to me is the benefit here where you just take that image put it into OpenShift and then it's already on this modern platform that you can now move it around and do as you see fit. Yes, you have to take that, you know, bespoke snowflake down to get that disk image potentially. Maybe you don't if it's a VM, but you know that it's safe because it's the whole disk image. You're not going to lose anything, right? Like you don't have to reconfigure anything. You know that if you're moving from one platform to another that you can now do that. Right. And it doesn't matter if it's yeah. VMs or containers. Yeah. And for me, it also comes down to like everything we do. Um, you, you have a choice, right? You don't have to use OpenShift virtualization. You can use Multis and you can connect pods directly to the same mm -hmm. you know, networks that the virtual machines are running on today. So mm -hmm. if you're happy with your virtualization platform and you just want to deploy Kubernetes, you know, OpenShift on top of that and then connect together con containerized application components and virtualized application components without worrying about ingress, egress, SDN, all of that other stuff, that's possible too. It yeah. ultimately comes down to how do you use them? How do you want to interact with them? How do you want to manage them? And which model best fits 
Um, you know, I always like to highlight skill sets first because right. people are yes. expensive. And <laughs> yes, so, so there's, a, there's a comment in the chat says admins cost more than CPU cycle. So that kind of, oh yeah. Ties in. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, you know, it's, um, you know, that being said, the cost of people can be eclipsed, um, due to inefficiencies, et cetera. Um, yeah. you know, I, I used totally. to, used to talk about, um, you know, I, I think we're going through this learning exercise. We, the industry, um, yeah, the market, I, I, yeah. IT mm -hmm. is a whole of cloud is really great, but I have to, um, there, there is more instances to achieve the same, you know, scale and availability, mm -hmm. um, which leads to sprawl, which leads to more administrator time as well as more, you know, even though, yes, there's a lot of it, um, automation, et cetera. So it's a balancing act. Yeah, it's it's and all there's... about finding the right tools to meet the skills that your people have or that you can get them easily. Uh, it's rarely about, right, like this is the best tool to run containers on, right? Like if you're worried about that, then like you have a different set of problems, right? Yeah, like, what, you're what's worried that about thing? like... Um, if if it looks stupid, but it works, it's not stupid. <laughs> Can't say I've heard that one, but okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. It's very oh, true. <laughs> move their knowledge into operators. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. That's the yeah. That's the big one, right? Like if you can take stuff that you do all the time and operationalize it into an operator and have Kubernetes do it for you whenever yeah. there's an event, that makes a lot more sense. Well, especially you know, yesterday afternoon, the the live stream that y'all did with the um, the Ansible based operator. Right. right. Ansible, especially for Red Hat administrators, is something that is or should be already very familiar. Mm -hmm. And if it's super easy to bring that in and deploy it as an operator, um, yes, you're having to learn some new skills, right? And learn some new concepts around how Kubernetes does things. But ultimately, the way things are, you know, Kubernetes seems to be pretty prevalent and not going anywhere. Um, that seems like a good idea to expand your skill sets. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we all had to learn virtualization at some point, right? Like now we have to yeah. learn, you know, containers and this new cloud native landscape that we're, you know, walking across essentially. And I don't think there's anything wrong with up leveling your skills. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity for people to take what they know and expand upon it and, you know, really kind of shine here. There's some really interesting use cases that come out of that as well. Um, I think our RHPDS team, um, is exploring some of those. I talked with a customer recently who's exploring some of those of basically creating an operator. Um, so you could create an Ansible operator, for example, to implement custom resource definitions to then manage other aspects of your infrastructure. Uh, right. So the example I like to use because uh, is storage, right? Yeah, my my sure. storage maybe has an Ansible play or a, a set of modules. So mm -hmm. I can create an Ansible operator that when I say create new LUN, you know, and I create a new LUN object in Kubernetes, it results in an Ansible module and playbook running that then reaches out to my storage and creates that, that volume does for me. The thing for you, yeah. So yeah, you can add in a lot of of other aspects um, if you so choose. If you mm -hmm. want to adopt Kubernetes as that um, or the Kubernetes paradigm as your interface. Well, and it seems like. You know, from my perspective, that the Kubernetes uh, paradigm is definitely um, not going anywhere, right? Like it, it's expanding and expanding rapidly. the The Ansible operator is like something that I truly love because you know my background is ops as well, and you know, stringing disparate systems together to do something like application deployments has always been something that I've had to do. Um, but the second Ansible, like I learned it and latched onto it, like it became this thing where it's like, I now have this in my toolbox and then, you know, joining the Ansible team in 2018, we were working on doing the operator framework bits and then getting that out the door. And then, you know, now seeing some people actually starting to build these operators and start using them in production, right? Like I think our metering operator in OpenShift is based on Ansible, which I thought was cool because I guess there was something going on there that I need to look at to see what they're doing specifically. But it's it's one of those things where if you have a sysadmin or you know a DevOps engineer or whatever, cloud engineer, whatever you're calling them these days, and they know Ansible, <clears throat> they're a couple steps away from being able to, to put some Ansible in Kubernetes just by using the operator framework. And that I think is like the true power of bring, bridging the gap, right? Like 
you know that there's something you can do in this environment when you learn just a little bit more. And then once you wrap your mind around the idea of VMs versus containers versus bare metal, everything kind of clicks together. Um, yeah. And it's cool. And, you know, I've done a couple of the workshops for our operator, uh, m making Ansible operators in Kubernetes. Unfortunately, the the summit one, I didn't, didn't get to see people's faces, but, you know, the last one we did at Ansible Fest in Atlanta, right? Like when pe people's eyes lit up when the dots connected, right? Like you can yeah. see the expression on their face, like, oh my gosh, like I could actually say like, hey, network, I need more. <laughs> and like it just yeah. auto added to K Kubernetes. <laughs> so it's funny because I I have what I'll call passing familiarity with Ansible. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm familiar with it, but I never got really in, involved with it. Right. So remember I came from the Windows world. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So PowerShell was always my thing. Right. Um, actually wrote a book about it. It's behind me somewhere over here. You wrote a book about um, PowerShell? I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, I was wow. a co-author, so, but yes. Damn, good for you. Um, so it, it was, it, it was, it has the same concepts and it has the same ability to, you know, while I never had or got familiar with Ansible's operation model um, in mm -hmm. depth, there's still the, a, the option of doing declarative um, configuration with PowerShell and with others. And it's a hugely powerful tool. Yes. Yeah. Ansible so, operator is a low barrier entry for administrators. Yeah. So I have a low knowledge, so that works out well for me. Yeah. The the the. <laughs> yeah. I I have a low knowledge when it comes to a, a lot of things, and Ansible actually helped me um, figure out how to manage, you know, like F five load balancers and things like that. Right. Like when you when you fully embrace Ansible, like you kind of see the world through the, through the lens of Ansible modules, which I think is fun. Um, you know, what can this module do? You know, what can't it do? How can I interact with this thing? And then once you, if you learn it like that, you kind of get a great operational knowledge of that device. Maybe not exactly how to run that device while you're on that device, but you can certainly Ansible that device into existence and out of existence if you want, you know? So but that's the whole purpose, right? I, I think, um, abstraction layers. Yeah. Right? Do, you, do yeah. you need to know, or do you just need it to do what it's supposed to do and, and trust that the system, whoever implemented the system implemented it with best practices. That's the right. whole purpose of operators, right? We, yes. we, you know, we codify that knowledge, um, et cetera. And that's why it's important for your operators to be adipotent because if they're not, then you're going to have these weird issues of things failing or things not starting when you thought they should have. And then Ansible enfor enforces that a dependency on top of you because if you don't write a good playbook, <laughs> it won't run right. So the, the two kind of pairing together makes, makes a good jive, makes a good story here um, and, and makes a lot of people happy when they first pick it up and start kicking the tires on Ansible operators. Absolutely. So, yeah. Cool. So I um I I don't have anything. I can sit here and chat all day, but uh yeah, I mean, I don't have any problems with Oh, there's a question here in chat. How fast does cluster destroy oh, happen on rev? Is there can, a time to do a destroy? Hell we can yes. Absolutely let's do it. show that. Um so let's move this down because it actually goes pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> So what I'll do is rearrange the windows a little bit so that way we can see both of these at the same time. And then so you can see it's going through and stopping and this takes a second to refresh. <laughs> I can force refresh it. So you can see the VMs are already down. You can see removing VM. Dang, this thing's plugging along. Yeah. Dang. <laughs> yeah, it, it goes fast. <laughs> Plays no games. <laughs> you want this thing gone? It gone. So there it's wow. it's done it's and the resources are gone. Vanished. Just do we have time? Yes, we have plenty of time. Okay, so more questions in chat. Uh let's see. Why does the rev icon for OpenShift nodes show as a desktop? Christian, if you remember, we had to select the desktop profile when we were first standing these up uh in Rev. I think that's why. Is that correct, Andrew? That is correct. Yep. Awesome. So see the this is a little desktop thing. This is a little server thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So when you select that desktop profile, like 
why not server is there did, does that explain anywhere um i honestly don't know i should ask that um yeah. I, I I assume that when we did the testing and validation, it was somebody determined that we didn't need whatever settings are associated with server. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. We'll have to no find out. All right. So here's a question for you. What's the advantage of virtualizing a VM in a container? In my understanding, it would be great to set up OCP on bare metal, then use OCP virtualization. I would love to see... Uh, Microsoft AD and exchanged to be containerized. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That would so be I, I, there's a couple of different things that I'll talk about here. Um, so the advantages of virtualizing a VM in a container. Um, so it, it, aside from the management plane, it is exactly right. the same, right? Yeah. The goal being it's, it's literally the same KVM. It's literally the same, you know, QEMU. It's literally the same library. So the VM itself, the implementation, the execution, all of those things are the same. It comes down to the control plane that you want to use. Do you want to use Kubernetes and OpenShift? Do you want to use uh, uh, Rev and or whatever your, you know, uh, I'll call it old school virtualization, data center virtualization interface. That, that's basically it from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people, especially developers, app teams, they like the Kubernetes thing, right? I submit objects. It's a desired state engine. It makes mm -hmm. everything happen. Um, yeah, the whole yeah you know, you can, you know, VMs behave um, as expected in OpenShift virtualization. So by default, it will create the VMs using the, uh, the live migration evacuation policy. Mm -hmm. So if I cordon and drain a node, it'll live migrate those, those VMs. I can set it so that it doesn't terminate. It, it just, you know, terminates the VM and then reschedules it and restarts it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, there is a video. Um, I'll see if I can find it. I feel like one of those old people that, you know, how, how do you find YouTube? I go and Google YouTube and then go there. But I can never remember our, uh, our YouTube I, channel. So for the Kubernetes community, I actually worked in the uh, infrastructure working group for a little bit just to create a shortcut to the YouTube. Uh, it, like, because they do all this DNS, all their management, all their URL shortening is all done in Kubernetes. And like I had to, I had to make like three or four commits just to get like yt.kates.io working because I was tired of because it's like youtube.com slash user slash Kubernetes community. Right? Christian already took care of this for us. OpenShift.tv. OpenShift.tv. That actually so, works. Oh my gosh! Uh, well, thank if you, you go there, there is a um, so there's a video that I created and then released uh, April 30th. So it says the date that shows creating a virtual machine using OpenShift virtualization and then managing it from both the Red Hat virtualization interface and the OpenShift virtualization interface. Cool. Um, so yeah, you can go and, you know, again, which management interface do you want? Because at the lower level, it's the same technology. You, know, you shouldn't care if it's in a container or anything like that. Um, it just works. So the, the second thing that I'll talk about, um, so OCP on bare metal and OCP virtualization. So you can do emulation, you can do nested virtualization. So if I have a virtual OpenShift cluster and I want to deploy OpenShift virtualization onto that, you can do that. Obviously you're gonna have the normal, uh, uh, you know, double, you know, nested virtualization performance penalty of it's not going to be fun. That being said, if, if you weren't paying attention or you didn't hear when I first started the stream, this set, this cluster right here, uh, in my rev uh, uh, environment mm -hmm. is OpenShift virtualization. It, it's I, I'm running a nested cluster inside of my own home lab in order to do testing and validation and stuff like that. It works fine with uh, the Fedora cloud images, stuff like that. When I start okay. trying to boot into more heavyweight operating systems, like if anything with a GUI, um, it gets painful. Oh, sure, it'd be <laughs> awful. Yeah. But for for you know creating videos for you know for doing demos and stuff like that, yeah, it works. And maybe for your application or your environment, that's fine. Um, but yeah, generally um, for performance reasons, you're gonna want to use bare metal. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know support's policy on nested virtualization. Support might say no. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it is technically possible. Well, it, yes, it's like, you know, I could run, uh, <laughs> I 
they run OpenShift virtualization on VMware, right? Like, I mean, it's technically yeah. possible. I could yeah. run VMware inside OpenShift virtualization potentially. Yeah, turn, I mean, turn the, on the, nested virtualization and it works fairly well, um, uh, you know, which if, again, if you're not familiar with uh, Red Hat virtualization, it's pretty straightforward to turn it on. Um, if, if I go to my host configuration here and then I go to the kernel tab, I just normally when it's unlocked, there's a checkbox right. here yeah. for turning on uh, nested virtualization. Nested virtualization. Right and you can yeah. see it just adds the kernel command line. So set that checkbox, click OK, and then you have to do a, uh, a reinstall, and it which it just reinstalls the packages and resets it. It doesn't reinstall the OS or anything. OK, I was, yeah, um, I was about to say. Yeah, so then you do that. It takes, I don't know, my host, it takes like five minutes for it to install packages and reboot, and it comes mm -hmm. up, and then you've got nested virtualization enabled. Wow. Uh, so yeah, you can go full inception. Yeah, and it, it works, um, like I said, it works well enough. Well enough. Um, okay. At least for, for my utilization. Um, that being said, so there's also the concepts and it was this was shown at KubeCon in Europe in, I wanna say in 2018. Okay. 2018 or 2019. Um, so Lu Ludse, L-O-O-D-S-E. Yes. Did a session with KubeVert where they had a Kubernetes cluster running on bare metal that would then spin up KubeVert virtual machines to host nested Kubernetes clusters on demand. So essentially, if you think about it, I could create an operator that creates OpenShift clusters or Kubernetes clusters by creating virtual machines to then deploy. Right? So you could end up with this on-demand thing in that manner as well. Spider web of everything. Yeah, that's cool. Awesome. Well, so uh, you said that Reese was doing a live stream about open virtualization. I believe that is. Yes, it's Thursday. It was Thursday. Th Thursday morning, at, uh, Eastern time. So yeah, we'll be demoing, deploying, and using OpenShift virtualization itself. So like, uh, you know, uh, Matt, Andrew put all the, the rev bits together for us and installed OCP on top of that. Now, after that, we'll dive into the, uh, the aspects of using OpenShift virtualization on a, on a, you know, clean cluster, basically from the get go kind of deal. Uh, yeah, and, and his, uh, his setup is what I used to create my cluster in here as well. So, right. Yeah, so the, the 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 expert will be coming on to talk about uh, all things. Well, not the expert, but an, an expert will be coming on to talk about OpenShift virtualization Thursday morning, nine o'clock Eastern time. That is uh, six a.m. Pacific. Sorry, and uh, I will give you UTC because that's how we roll in Kubernetes land. It is thirteen hundred UTC. Um, to be fair, Reese is over in in Europe, so yes. So he is he's in London, I believe. So it'll be two p.m. his time, I think. Wales, uh, Wales. Yes. Is that, is that GMT or UTC at that I, point? I, I don't. I don't remember. Yeah, 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 I don't know. Um, oh, yeah. I see. I see somebody asking why not LXD slash LXC. Um, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I am not I smart either. enough to understand um, the difference between the different containerizing technologies. Um, so yeah. I do, I do know who we can ask. So if anybody wants to reach out to me, um, I don't know if that person is a, is an employee or not. You can reach out to me, Andrew.Sullivan at Red Hat. Um, and we can find out the answer to that. Yeah, there you go. Um, cool. Andrew, any parting thoughts, words, anything else before we uh, jump off of here? Nothing relevant. <laughs> Nothing relevant. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, please join us on Thursday. There's also a stream uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon at 1300 Eastern, 1700 UTC about playing with Prometheus. So uh, Eric Jacobs and Josh Woods, who also wrote a book on operators, will be joining me. Uh, oh, we'll be joining the stream to uh, tinker with Prometheus. And then on Thursday morning, again, the OpenShift virtualization demo. So please... Subscribe to the channel. Uh, stay tuned on social media. Stay tuned to Twitch. There'll be more sessions like this. We'll get sound figured out <laughs> all, <laughs> all in due time. Uh, really appreciate everybody joining today. Thank you very much. Until next time, stay safe out there, folks.